Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. My name is Zinat Rahman. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Politics, and we are so pleased to welcome you to a discussion today between Congressman Adam Schiff of California and Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois. Uh, before one of our students formally introduces our guests in a few minutes, I would like to mention a couple of upcoming events we have next week at the IOP. Um, on Tuesday, November 2nd, we're going to be having an election night watch party to watch the returns from across the country. And before the par party, current IOP Pritzker Fellow and former New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landrieu uh, will be in conversation with Faz Shocker, who is a political advisor to Senator Bernie Sanders and the Senator's campaign manager during the 2020 election. Um, and they'll talk about off-year elections and the direction of the Democratic Party. So that's on Tuesday, November 2nd. On Thursday, November 4th, we're, please join us as we welcome Governor Jay Inslee from the state of Washington for a timely discussion on the environment before the governor travels to Glasgow, Scotland for the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26. Um, and award-winning energy and climate change journalist Amy Harder, who is the executive editor of Cypher, will moderate the conversation with Governor Cypher. Um, Excuse me, with Governor Inslee. Audience questions. We will have time for audience questions. Um, we'll open the floor up. So please line up to ask your questions. And remember that everybody is welcome at the microphone. We do give preference to student questions. Um, and if you could keep your mask on when you ask your questions. And then please also make sure your phones are on silent. Um, and now it's my pleasure to hear formal introductions from our speakers, of our speakers from Alexandra Petsakis. Alexandra is a fourth year student in the college from Pasadena, California, studying sociology and global studies. Alexandra is an events ambassador at the Institute of Politics and has been a highly engaged student throughout her time at the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Alexandra to the podium. Hello, thank you all for being here today. I have the great honor of introducing Congressman Adam Schiff and Senator Tammy Duckworth, two very distinguished members of Congress. They will discuss Congressman Schiff's new book, Midnight in Washington, and in it he argues that the Trump presidency so weakened our institutions and compromised the Republican Party that the peril facing American democracy will last for years. Congressman Adam Schiff represents California's 20th Congressional District in the Greater Los Angeles area, and he is currently in his 11th term in the House of Representatives. Schiff serves as the chair of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, which oversees the nation's intelligence agencies, and he notably led the first impeachment of former President Donald Trump. Congressman Schiff is also a member of the Special Select House Committee investigating the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. He was formerly a member of the California State Senate, and he also served as a former assistant U.S. attorney in Los Angeles. Moderating, the, moderating this discussion is Sen Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois, an Iraq War veteran and Purple Heart recipient who served in the Obama administration as Assistant Secretary of Veteran Affairs and as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives before being elected in 2016 to the U.S. Senate. She sits on the Armed Services, Environment and Public Works, Commerce Senate and Transportation, and Small Business and Entrepreneurship Senate Committees. Introducing Congressman Schiff and Senator Duckworth is very personal for me. I'm a Pasadena, the California native, and Congressman Schiff was my congressman growing up until redistricting occurred several years ago. While he's technically no longer my congressman, as a proud resident of Pasadena in the greater Los Angeles area, I have been so proud over the years to see how he has represented our area and upheld integrity so valiantly in Washington. Senator Duckworth has always been one of my greatest role models. As a woman who is passionate about public service and politics, I have looked up to Senator Duckworth for years. I am inspired by her courage, tenacity to advocate for her constituents and all Americans, and how she is one of a handful of progressive female senators. We are very lucky to have Congressman Schiff and Senator Duckworth with us today. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I have really enjoyed reading this book, and it's very interesting because I, um, when I came to, when I went to Congress for the first time when I was elected in 2012, um, uh, Adam was already in leadership and playing a leadership role in Congress, and uh, our paths have sort of crossed back and forth over the years in that we both served on the Benghazi Committee together, and then when he led the impeachment. 
um, I was in the Senate as one of the jurors of the, of the impeachment trial. So I'm going to start off with a very broad question, but I, I want to pick up some themes throughout the book, you know, the degradation of institutions in this country that made Donald Trump possible. But it's the degradation didn't just happen with the office of the presidency, but it had to do with the role of media, the role of Congress, members of Congress not living up to the standards that we expect of one another. Um, so the first question, I just want to begin by asking, what led you to write this book? Um, and, and what are you hoping the American people get from it? Very broad. Um, well, Tammy, thank you for moderating today. And um, it's wonderful to sit down with you again. I think the last time we sat down together uh, for a forum was during the Benghazi hearings. Yes. Uh, and this is a much more pleasant atmosphere, I can tell you. <laughs> um, but uh, um, and, uh, and I just want to also say how grateful I am uh, that you're here today, because I would much rather talk about your book, which is phenomenal. <laughs> uh, if you haven't read or listened to Tammy's book, it's wonderful. I've just started listening to it, uh, and it, it's phenomenal. It's Thank particularly you. fun to hear Tammy narrate it. Um, but uh, during the course of the last several years, uh, uh, what led me to write this was any number of our colleagues uh, in the House uh, would stop me on the House floor and say, I hope you're writing this down. You better be writing this down. Uh, and I would always give the same response, which was, when do I possibly have time to write any of this down? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then suddenly the pandemic hit, and I, like the rest of the country, was sequestered uh, at home. Uh, and I thought, if I'm going to write this down, this is the time for me to do it. And I really had two audiences in mind. Um, the, <laughs> I, at least after the first trial, I thought impeachments are rare. They don't happen very often. Little did I know there was going to be another one uh, soon thereafter. Um, but we're still studying the impeachment that took place of Andrew Johnson a century and a half ago. And I wanted to write uh, to an audience of future historians that would look back on this period and, and want to know what this was about. But I also wanted to sound the alarm about what was happening to our democracy. Because during the course of the early Trump year, um, the early Russia investigation, I reached two uh, terrible conclusions, which now seem pretty self-evident, but at the time were pretty shocking to me. And the first was, even as we were looking into how Russia had meddled in our 2016 election, how aggressively they sought to elect Donald Trump uh, and to divide uh, and pit Americans against other Americans, even as I was looking into that, it became clear looking at the actions of our own administration that the most profound threat to our democracy no longer came from outside the country, it came from within. Uh, and part, and this was the second uh, epiphany, if you will, part of the reason why that attack on our democratic institutions by the former president was so astonishingly successful was that it had the, the willing participation of so many of the people that we serve with who, frankly, I had thought much better of, uh, many of whom I had admired and respected because I believed that they believed what they were saying. And as it turned out, none of what they had professed in terms of their ideology or beliefs mattered at all compared to holding their job or maybe getting a better position. And, uh, and that continues to this day uh, with the propagation of the big lie. Um, and I wanted to tell that story about how uh, so many people um, came to allow themselves to be so badly used. Um, to give but one very recent illustration, uh, Steve Scalise, the second-ranking Republican in the House, was on Fox a couple weeks ago, and he was asked repeatedly by Chris Wallace, essentially, can you just say the election wasn't stolen? And he couldn't even bring himself to say that simple truth. Now, I have to think that when Steve Scalise ran for Congress some years ago, when he first ran for Congress, he didn't say to himself, I want to run for Congress so one day I can deceive the country about our elections and undermine our democracy. But here he is. And, and I wanted to write about how that happens uh, to even good people and how they come to do, to do uh, su such ill in terms of our democracy. Wonderful. So let's set the stage as to where we are today. And, and you do that at the beginning of the book by talking about January 6th, when the insurrection happened. And I, I want to quote, a, um, so you and I were both there that day. Um, I was in the tunnels underneath the Capitol, um, trying to get to the floor to give um, uh, some remarks at, um, 
2.30 I was in the tunnels. At 2.15 was when they broke through the doors. Uh, and the Capitol Police stopped me and said, Senator, you can still make it. They're not up through all the doors. We're starting to lock down the Capitol. You can make it to the floor of the Senate, um, and then we'll evacuate you together with all of the other senators. Um, or you can stop now, um, but then you may have to secure yourself someplace, and we, can't, we might not be able to get to you for a while. That a while turned out to be about three or four hours where I had to secure myself in a secure location um, with a staff member because I chose not to go forward because being in a wheelchair, I know that there's only one way on and off the Senate floor that's wheelchair accessible. Um, you were there that day, and I, I just want to quote um, from your book a conversation you had with a Republican colleague speaking about going through the halls of Congress as these protesters were coming through the doors. And, and this is what he said about the, the, the protesters to, to, um, to you. You can't let them see you. A, Re a Republican member said to me, you're right. He's right, another Republican member said. I know these people. I can talk to them. I can talk my way through them. You're in a whole different category. In that moment, we were not merely members of different political parties, but on opposite sides of a much more dangerous divide. At first, I was oddly touched by these GOP members and their evident concern, but by then I had been receiving death threats for years, and that feeling soon gave way to another. If these Republican members hadn't joined the president in, a false, in falsely attacking me for four years, I would need to be worried about my security. None of us would. So, so talk a little bit about how you know the, the setting that you sit, that, that you made here. Um, what was your experience like on that awful day? Um, I had suggested to the speaker a few months before the election that we form a little group uh, to try to analyze all the things that could go wrong. Uh, what if the Electoral College was tied? What if a state sent two slates of electors? What if Mike Pence didn't do his job? And we tried to, to uh, scheme out all the things that could happen, and, and there were about a thousand different possibilities that we predicted except the one, of course, that happened. Um, we didn't expect there to be a violent attack on the Capitol. Um, but because I had suggested this, the speaker had, had me and three of my colleagues uh, manage the floor debate against this effort to decertify the election. And so I was on the House floor when I looked up uh, and suddenly noticed the speaker was not in her chair. And I knew from our preparations that she had planned to preside come hell or high water as long as it took. And and I, it struck me as odd, but I didn't really appreciate uh, what was happening until two Capitol Police rushed back on the House floor, grabbed Steny Hoyer, our number two, uh, and ran him off the floor so fast, I remember thinking to myself, I've never seen Steny move that fast. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then they, the police came back on and gave us uh, you know, sequentially more serious uh, warnings. Um, there were protesters in the building, rioters in the building, you need to get out your gas masks. Uh, you need to get ready to get down on the ground. Uh, and then sometime thereafter, you need to get out. Uh, and they threw the doors open on one side of the chamber. And there was a real scrum to get out the doors. And um, I felt reasonably calm, so I didn't feel the need to join the scrum. And what's more, a lot of that scrum were Republican members with no masks. Um, and. Uh, this was January, pre-vaccine, and I wasn't eager to be uh, in the midst of them either. And this was when a, a young woman staffer came up to me uh, because I was just waiting and said, you know, Mr. Schiff, are you all right? And she was all about 20-something, and I was just struck by her presence. And I said, I'm fine. I just don't want to join the melee at the door. And, and then after, as an afterthought, I asked her, are you all right? Uh, and she nodded, and uh, soon thereafter, I had Republicans come up to me and had this conversation where they made it clear that they felt um, I couldn't let these people see me. And um, I did have that, you know, that you know, first reaction of being touched, that they were worried about me, but then that soon gave way to a much stronger emotion, frankly, that if they hadn't been pushing this lie about the election, None of us would be in jeopardy. And, and that feeling in the days that followed, I don't know whether it was the same for you, but I found my, my anger growing not at even the people who are committing horrible acts of violence, but the, the, what I describe as the insurrectionists in suits and ties, the people inside our chamber 
because those outside the chamber really believed the big lie. Mm -hmm. But the people across the aisle in the House knew it was a big lie. Uh, and even after they saw to the terrible end to which it brought the country, we went back on the floor later that night. They were still pushing the big lie. And, and they're still pushing it today, all around the country. And many of them who condemned uh, the actions that night, uh, not the least of which Mitch McConnell, are now defending the big lie, which is quite a remarkable place. Um, but this threat to your life and your family, and you talk about this, I think, very movingly, and uh, for me, that same night when we retook the Senate floor, because we were not going to not retake the Senate floor, we were going to finish our job, that those of you who voted, voted to put us in there, and I, you know, I, come hello high water, I was going to be there to, to cast my vote. I was asked to speak about you know, if, if we had gone on with what these protesters wanted, we would disenfranchise military men and women um, who vote by mail in significant, significant accounts and talk about how I had voted by mail from Iraq in 2006. And by the time I gave my five-minute speech, stood up, gave my five-minute speech, and sat down, my cell phone buzzed, and I looked down, and there was a death threat to my personal cell phone, naming my family and my home address. Wow, jeez. This is, I, I know where you live, I'm a veteran, I'm former police officer, um, you know, you better, you better watch out. Um, but this is now commonplace, so let's talk about how we got here. How we got here, where it's commonplace to threaten the lives of, of, of um, public officials, of civil servants, but also how do we get the degradation of our institutions? Um, I'm going to try to go through the book chapter by chapter, but there are some themes that span, so we might go back and forth a little bit in the timeline. Some people in the media and on the right accuse you of being some sort of a partisan lightning rod because of the role that you played with, um, even prior to the impeachment because of your role on the um, uh, uh, Intelligence Committee. Um, but you actually had a pretty bipartisan upbringing, didn't you? I did. I did. Uh, my... Mother uh, came from a long line of Republicans. I have a wonderful photo uh, on the wall uh, in my office of my mother's father, who was an Eisenhower delegate, mm -hmm. uh, the Republican county chair in western Massachusetts. Uh, and my grandfather never had anything very good to say about Democrats. Um, I only remember him referring to the other party in a three-word uh, alliterative, those damn Dems. Um, <laughs> My father, on the other hand, came from a long line of Democrats and uh, Roosevelt New Deal Democrats. Uh, they were yellow dog Democrats, uh, so devoted to the party they would rather vote for a yellow dog than vote Republican. Um, but it was never acrimonious between my parents. Uh, my brother became a Republican, I became a Democrat. Um, as a kid, we used to go to this place called the Wayside Inn in western Massachusetts. And we took my mother back there years later and didn't notice when we were kids that they had two benches outside this place that was, I think, built in the 1800s, and one bench says Republicans and the other bench says Democrats. So we have a nice family photo with, uh, with two of us on one side and one on the other. <laughs> um, well, I, I, you know, when, we're in, when you're in the House with your colleagues and the Senate with your colleagues, you sort of know where their background is in the immediate, you know, in the immediate past. But you don't really oftentimes hear about people's early, their beginnings and, and, and how they were, you know, what, what formed you. Um, um, I think you were uniquely suited to deal with a demagogue in, in Donald Trump because you started off your early career. And I really enjoyed that portion in your book where you talk about being in Czechoslovakia as, as, as a young, I think you were an attorney by this point, you were yeah. with USAID. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because, you know, it's, did you ever in all those years think that you're going to have to be dealing with a demagogue? In the capital of the United States? No, no, I didn't at all. And I had a couple experiences that, you're right, looking back, seemed like, like a kind of an oddly fortuitous preparation for things yeah. to come. Um, I was an assistant U.S. attorney in Los Angeles, and uh, one of the cases I was asked to try involved a, an FBI agent uh, who had been indicted for spying for the Russians. Uh, and so I worked with the Bureau extensively on investigating Russian spy craft and how Russians target people of, in this case, Miller, uh, low morals, flanderers, greedy people uh, for exploitation. And little did I know that that targeting would bring a bell later in life. Um, but, uh, 
but after that case, I, I had the opportunity to, um, to work in Eastern Europe for six months. The Attorney General at the time uh, sent a senior prosecutor to three Eastern European countries that were newly out of the, the, the Soviet orbit, and uh, I was sent to Czechoslovakia. And when I was there, um, there was a, uh, a xenophobic populist running to be the Slovak prime minister, a guy named Vladimir Mečiar. And I witnessed how he used uh, ethnic hatreds and, and bigotry to polarize uh, people. And I was there for six months. In the middle of my six-month tenure, I remember early on meeting with a Czechoslovak uh, chief justice of their high court uh, who was convinced that the, the Slovak agitation for separation was just posturing. Um, well, by the time I left, it was two different countries. Czechoslovakia had split. Um, and, and a big part of the reason why was this, this exploitation of the other, um, the, the, the skill for use by Mečiar of pointing to the, the Romani community or the Hungarian-speaking community or others uh, and the Czechs uh, as the other uh, and blaming the, uh, the economic travails on the other. And so I, I got to see in very short order how potent that was in literally tearing a country apart. Uh, and that too would, would have a terrible uh, and familiar echo many years later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about Benghazi, because I do think there's a, there's a trend that's happening here um, with how members of Congress, the institution of the Congress of the United States, how the standards of conduct for both members of the House and the Senate seems to have degraded. Like the bar keeps getting lowered for how we behave, right? And, and I think for me, the eye-opening time was Benghazi. And even before Benghazi, which was 2010 election with the Tea Party election, when the real attacks and the, and the, and, and, and the Tea Party movement started, um, I sort of feel like that set up the stage for how Benghazi was, was, was conducted. Benghazi, you know, that committee, I went into it trying to figure out what did we do, what happened that was wrong that led to the death of some heroes, uh, 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 the, 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 you know, the, the agents who were there, the, um, the security personnel, the Marines, and, and of course the ambassador. And to never, to learn the lessons and never, never make those mistakes again. But the Republicans on the committee were really there to attack Hillary Clinton. So talk a little bit about how Benghazi is sort of like the start of this, you know, what we're going to see later in the impeachment and the second impeachment. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, on the Intelligence Committee, uh, and I was a fairly junior member of the Intelligence Committee at that time, mm -hmm. we did a bipartisan, indeed nonpartisan investigation of Benghazi. We were one of about five committees in the Congress at that mm -hmm. time, including Armed Services, House, and Senate, who, were, who did investigations. And our investigation, like all of the others, um, debunked all of these conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton. Uh, there were conspiracy theories that she had personally intervened to weaken the security at the, at the consular facility for God knows what reason, but uh, uh, resulting in the death of these four Americans. Um, None of those investigations produced the kind of fodder that uh, Kevin McCarthy and the Republican leadership wanted. Uh, so McCarthy pushed to form the Select Committee that you and I ended up serving on. Um, at the time, John Boehner was the speaker, and John Boehner said it would be a waste of time. What was the point? We'd already investigated Benghazi. But McCarthy prevailed. Uh, and in a very unguarded moment, McCarthy would later admit the whole point of the Benghazi Select Committee was to tear Hillary's numbers down. But it was how they chose to tear her numbers down that was really a bridge to the Republican future. Because the way they chose to tear her numbers down was to create this complete alternate reality about what happened in Benghazi, uh, where Hillary Clinton was this scheming villain uh, who intervened to, to reduce the security there and, um, and wouldn't send reinforcements and a whole host of other outlandish allegations. But it was, it was a bridge to the future because it was the first illustration that even something as terrible and tragic as the death of four Americans was not beyond exploitation um, to, to tear down a Democratic candidate for president. Uh, and they were willing to push out these patently false, provably false, proved by their own Republican members false, 
theories if it would serve that end. And they were in charge this whole time. They were in the majority. So right. all of this investigation had happened, happened under Republican majority. So they were the ones who found out that there was no... No there there. No there there. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, here in Illinois, we uh, had our voter files stolen, our entire voter file stolen of everyone in the state back in 2015. We lost. Uh, and the way they got in was there was one box that you filled in with, um, uh, I think you could like ask some question and, and they did not put, we did not have a limit on how many characters and that was how they got into the system. So our voter files was one of the ones that was stolen um, and this leads into the Russian interference and, and talking about, you know, we talk about Benghazi was really used to tear down Hillary. Here comes the effort to support Donald Trump, right? And now here comes the Russian effort at simult that's happening at the same time. Speak about that and, and, and what, you know, as, as you're looking at Russian interference into the election and, and Devin Nunez and, and, and yeah. as you go into real detail in the book and, and, and if you've not read it, really read it because it was really eye-opening what was happening in the House. Well, and one of the reasons that I wanted to write about this particular part of this recent history is there was such a successful propaganda effort by the former president and also by Bill Barr uh, to push out this false no collusion, no obstruction line that, uh, you know, it was a really quite uh, and terrible uh, illustration of the power of propaganda when amplified particularly by the right-wing media, so by the Fox and Newsmax and now OANs of the world. Um, and I wanted to, to both describe how the investigation was conducted, but also what did we learn? Because most Americans would be surprised by how simple and how graphic the evidence was. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, I go through in the book was all of the efforts Republicans made not to find out the answers. Because during the first two years of that investigation, it was run by Devin Nunes and the Republicans. Uh, and we would have witnesses come in. In fact, this is very pertinent to the present. Steve Bannon was one of the witnesses who came in. Well, the first time Steve Bannon came in, he refused to answer questions about anything he discussed with the president while he was in the White House or even during the transition, uh, claiming a transition privilege that had heretofore never been heard of. Um, well, he was subpoenaed to come back uh, to, to be compelled to answer our questions. And when he came back under subpoena now, no longer a voluntary witness, he had 25 questions that he would deign to answer that he had helpfully written out in advance of his deposition. Uh, and he'd also written the answers, which were a uniform word, no. Um, so, for example, there are questions like, did you meet with Devin Nunes to discuss the Russia investigation? And the answer was no. And I asked him, well, did you speak with him about the investigation? Um, and his answer was yes. And then his lawyer said, don't answer that. Um, and I said, you're, you're too late for that. Um, and I, I asked Bannon, you know, where did you get these questions and answers from? And he got them from the White House. So the White House had written the only questions that he would be allowed to answer and the answers for him. And the Republicans were fine with that. They wouldn't, they wouldn't hold him in contempt. They wouldn't. Well, they wouldn't do anything. Uh, they weren't interested in the truth, but nonetheless, we learned a lot about what the Russians had done. We learned a lot about what the Trump campaign had done uh, with them. Uh, in particular, and, and this to me is the most graphic uh, and most direct uh, evidence uh, that we produced and, and good investigative journalists and others um, of collusion, and that is that while the Russians, through their intelligence uh, agencies, were running a massive uh, and clandestine social media campaign to elect Donald Trump. The Russian, same Russian intelligence was meeting with Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort. And Paul Manafort was giving this agent of Kremlin intelligence internal campaign polling data and their strategy in key battleground states while that unit of intelligence was running this campaign, essentially the super PAC, to elect Donald Trump. Um, but but when the, uh, the investigation concluded uh, and Bob Mueller was brought in to testify, um, Bill Barr did such a, uh, uh, a overwhelming job of deceiving the public about what was in that report, first by putting out a summary that was mm -hmm. completely at odds with the report, 
but then even on the day that he felt compelled weeks later to finally release the report, doing a press conference where he again misrepresented the report, um, that the narrative was really set. Uh, and the power to overcome that simple narrative of no obstruction, no collusion, um, proved to be enormously difficult. Uh, but I wanted to set out the facts so people could understand just how uh, intimately the Russians got involved in helping Donald Trump win, just how much the Trump campaign welcomed that help, made use of that help, lied to cover up that help. Um, and Donald Trump's escape of accountability for his Russia misconduct in 2016 led directly to his Ukraine misconduct. Because it was the day after Bob Mueller testified, the day after Donald Trump felt he'd finally escaped the jailer with respect to his Russian misconduct, that he was on the phone with the president of Ukraine, this time seeking help from yet another country to cheat in yet another election. Um, and I think you can draw another straight line between his ultimate uh, acquittal in the Senate for his Ukraine misconduct, for withholding hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid from that country which was at war with Russia, is at war with Russia, to course them to, to help him cheat in the election. You could draw a straight line between that acquittal and the insurrection uh, and the pushing out of big lies about the election that led to that violent attack. Um, and, and so the Russia story is a very important one because it demonstrates with respect to the, the former president that the failure to hold him accountable on one thing led to an even greater abuse and the failure to hold him accountable on that greater abuse led to a violent attack on the Capitol. Um, and the failure to hold him accountable going forward um, leads us into, into real darkness. I think that's so important because it starts off with the failure in, in Benghazi. We see a real attempt um, with Republican leaders who are in power to basically create this whole uh, uh, spectacle in order to tear down Hillary. So now you see this degradation of the behavior of members of Congress. It's not just about Donald Trump and his campaign, but it's the members of Congress as well. Now, I didn't, I, I didn't put two and two together. You said it was the next day after he felt that he had escaped from prosecution with the Russia um, um, scandal. That's when he's on the phone with the Ukrainians. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we see, let's, let's go into the first impeachment. Um, I sit in the, in the Senate um, in the back row with Sheldon Whitehouse, Sherrod Brown, and Martin Heinrich, we're kind of like the back of the school bus kids. <laughs> and we sat and, wa you know, and we, we paid attention, but, but, but we could get away with like a lot of like, oh my God, eye rolling and, and get away with it because we're so far back that um, nobody see. But I thought every time you came forward and, and, you're, and, and, and how you spoke, beginning with how you presented the case with your very first, uh, uh, when you addressed us the first time, was so powerful. Um, but you knew what you were up against. Right, coming over that that um, I, I think I, I got the sense that you that um, you still had some hope there that maybe the Senate and the Republican senators would do what was right if you could just present the facts. We, there was a real effort there. We, yes, I, I mean we a real belief. we thought going into that trial that uh, we were up against a very high bar. Um, in fact, I remember um, not long after the speaker asked me to, to lead that trial, uh, telling her that we were likely to lose the trial um, and that we needed to think about it differently, that, uh, that we needed to think about how we could win by losing. And, and I think that the way, the way I conceptualized it was there were really two juries. It was the jury that you were a part of in the Senate that we were likely to lose. And then there was the jury of the American people. And as between the two juries, the latter was more important, uh, particularly since the verdict seemed baked. Um, there was always the chance if, if Bolton came forward and did his duty, which he didn't, um, or the Senate allowed witnesses, which they didn't, that the door might have been opened uh, in a way that would have um, created a very helpful uncertainty uh, in the sense that one new witness might have led to another to another. So I, I didn't exclude the possibility that we could win, but I knew that it would be very hard. Um, and still, um, we, we were aiming for the 40 million Americans who we thought were still undecided. We were aiming to the four senators we thought were undecided and the 40 million Americans 
that we, were, uh, that we thought were undecided. And we want to make the case to them. Uh, and I'd like to believe that, that we made the case sufficiently to the country that when the country had a chance to return Donald Trump to office or reject him, that it helped inform the decision to reject him. Um, and I, I did, and at the end of the trial, though notwithstanding the verdict, I ended up feeling quite optimistic, um, mostly because of what Mitt Romney did. And I was in the House cloakroom. Um, I don't know if you recall where you were when you heard his verdict, but I didn't know what the verdict was going to be. And I was alone in the House cloakroom, which is this kind of old-fashioned lounge lizardy room behind the House floor. Um, and I was alone in the room when my staff uh, opened the door and said that Romney was going to be speaking, and he was hearing that he was going to convict. And I didn't believe him. Uh, I mean, I heard so many different things over the course of the last few years, I didn't believe anything that sounded too good to be true. And, and so Romney began speaking, and he began cataloging what Donald Trump had done, but then I'd heard other senators do the same thing, and they inevitably got to a point where they said, but, uh, and they gave the reason why they were still not going to convict. Um, and, and then Romney began talking about his faith, uh, how he, his faith was so deeply important to him, and that he had taken an oath before God, uh, and he got quite emotional about it, and and talked about his children and his grandchildren. And I thought to myself, my God, he's going to convict. And it was such a beautiful and courageous speech. He acknowledged that he knew the blowback he was going to get, um, but that he'd taken an oath. And, and that oath meant something to him. And I remember thinking that uh, the founders were right, that people possessed sufficient virtue to govern themselves, that we didn't need to be ruled by a despot. Um, and, and so just that single act of courage, um, you know, restored my faith that, that this experiment is going to continue. Um, I, I titled this book Midnight in Washington because midnight is the darkest hour of every day everywhere in the world, but it's also a, a hopeful time because you know that what follows uh, is filled with light. I have every confidence we're going to get through this, uh, but I do think that what we do in this moment will determine uh, how quickly we get through it and how much damage we have to suffer along the way. So it's a, it's a very important time. But um, there were a lot of heroes that came out of this period. Um, the Marie Ivanoviches and the Alexander Vindmans and the Fiona Hills mm -hmm. and uh, even people like uh, Dan Coates, um, former Republican senator of Indiana, who became the head of the intelligence community and wouldn't lie for the president about Russia, North Korea, or anything else, and was willing to lose his job and did lose his job. Um, there, were, there were some really heroic people in this period. Uh, I think what uh, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are doing uh, requires great courage. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see the, the story of where we are in, 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 in an illustration of two people. Um, Robert Caro once said in an interview that power doesn't corrupt as much as it reveals. It doesn't always reveal us for our best, but it reveals. And if you look at, at Liz Cheney and Elise Stefanik, uh, you see one person who said, no, I'm not going to lie for that president. I'm not going to lie about something as fundamental as our elections. Um, and I'm willing to lose my leadership position over that. And then you saw Lee Stefanik say, you need someone to carry the big lie, I'm your person. Um, because nothing is more important to me than advancing within the party. Um, and in that tale of two people, um, you see a lot of what happened in the Congress over the last four or five years, where some people really demonstrated great courage and others demonstrated they're nothing but ambition. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I'm betting on those who put their love of country first, mm -hmm. because I think there are millions and millions more Americans who love and cherish our democratic legacy than there are people who are, at the moment, willing to tear it down. Yeah. And, and I thought that was so powerful in, in the book, you know, to, as you were getting into the, the later chapters where you, where you do bring back the hope. Um, I, I have to say, I'm going to be a little petty, Mitch McConnell, I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Mitt Romney did not vote to convict on all the counts. 
<laughs> I was there. It's like he's getting credit. I'm, I'm, he's very, very powerful, but not on all the counts. He did not. Um, uh, uh, but what I th- hope the American people saw, if you watched it, was the heroism of the civil servants. Yes. The heroism of the civil servants, a much maligned group of people who go to work every day, do, you know, Fiona Hill and, and, and do amazing things um, uh, and, and stood up for what is right. And I, I just thought that that was so hopeful. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about Alexander Vindman and, and, and um, uh, those folks as part of the trial process? I, I, I do. And, uh, you know, I, I, I first uh, would, would mention Marie Ivanovich, uh, who was this courageous ambassador to Ukraine. Yes. Um, She's at an event in Ukraine honoring a woman who had just died, who was an anti-corruption crusader in Ukraine, a Ukrainian woman who had acid thrown in her face and died months later, a terrible, painful death. And she's honoring this woman, and she gets called from the State Department saying, you need to come back to Washington. Um, and she doesn't understand why and what's going on. And they say, no, you need to come back. And she says, well, OK, I'll take care of some stuff. No, no, you need to come back on the next plane. We can't vouch for your safety anymore. And she was in danger not because of anything the Ukrainians were doing. She had served in other dangerous places around the world, in, in, in uh, Somalia and places like that. She was in danger because our own president and his son and the, the idiots on Fox primetime were attacking and smearing her. And she comes back to Washington. Um, she's forced out of her post. She asks, what did I do? Did I do anything wrong? No, you didn't do anything wrong. And, and that's not enough. They, they need to destroy her. They need to smear her and destroy her. And she's told not to testify. Now, Marie Ivanovich was the first who was an active civil servant, foreign servant, who we subpoenaed to come in and who defied the president. And had she not shown that kind of courage, uh, none of the others might have followed. Um, and I, I'll never forget when she walked into that hearing room all, all alone and sat down at that table alone. Just the kind of hushed respect that fell over the audience in that room. Uh, and during the course of that hearing, the president is attacking her in real time while she's testifying. And, and when she was finished and she got up to leave, she stood up to leave, the whole room stood up with her. Uh, out of respect. Um, and these, these folks were truly heroic. Um, you know, similarly, Alexander Vindman, and as you say, Fiona Hill. And I don't think it's an accident that, that uh, Fiona Hill and Marie Ivanovich and Alexander Vindman are all immigrants. Um, they, they all came to this country in search of a better life, as did their family, and, and they have an ideal of this country. Um, that, that guides them. Um, and that, that idea, that ideal, is really at risk right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I'm, I'm inspired by their example. I think those are the examples that we should follow. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we have just about 17 minutes left. I want to make sure we do get to some questions because I think the students are also, um, you know, the folks that I hope are the next generation of uh, civil servants and, and folks who will get into government to help raise up the ideals of our country. So we're going to begin on this side with the first question. Um, and then I'm going to give you five minutes right at the end so you can wrap up. Great. Hello. Um, so first of all, it's an honor to have you here today. Uh, thank you for coming. So my name is Braden Hager. I'm a first year here in the college. And what I'm wondering is, is bipartisanship realistic, sustainable, or even practical when we're living in a uh, winner-takes-all two-party electoral system? Uh, you know, I'm happy to start, and, and then, Tim, I'd love to hear your yeah. thoughts also. Um, it is possible, and, and it actually happens quite a lot more than you would think. It doesn't always get the attention of everything else, but, but just to use one very prominent example, the infrastructure bill is a bipartisan bill. Uh, and it's a not insubstantial uh, effort. Um, in the Intelligence Committee, uh, you know, my ranking member is Devin Nunes, uh, and we've had no shortage of disagreements over the years, as you might know. Um, but nonetheless, 
every year, even in the midst of our most vehement disagreements over Russia and Ukraine, we have done the work of the Intelligence Committee. And every year we have produced uh, an annual Intelligence Authorization Act, which is the product of our uh, full year's oversight. And we've done so uh, on a bipartisan basis. So that work does get done. But, but the one very prominent uh, exception to this, which in some respects overwhelms everything else, is right now the Republican Party, in my view, uh, under Donald Trump, has become an anti-truth, anti-democratic cult of the former president uh, that is tearing down our democratic institutions. Around the country, they are stripping independent elections officials of their duties so that if they can't get a secretary of state to find 11,780 votes, last time they're determined to have someone in that position, next time who will. And as long as the party leadership is hostile to our democracy, there is no working with them on issues affecting democracy because we are completely cross purposes. Um, and in that respect, they just need to be beaten. Um, and, and so, uh, whatever it takes to get voting rights passed and HR1 passed, we're going to have to do without Republican support, in, in my opinion, because their business model now, their political business model now, is disenfranchising people, particularly people of color. Uh, and as long as that's where they're coming from, there's no accommodating that. Uh, I, I think they just need to be defeated. Yeah, I, I, I happen to agree with you. I do think that... Um Bipartisanship is possible. I passed uh, this past year a drinking water and wastewater bill with 89 votes off the floor. So it is possible. Uh, uh, but I do think two things would help it be even more possible, and that is um, passing the Voting Rights Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I'm willing to end the filibuster, actually restore the filibuster to what it used to be in order to do it. And I also think something that we're going through right now, you might not know, Adam, is that um, we're doing the redistricting, the boundary lines are being drawn. And last night, I think they voted in Springfield on a proposed new line, uh, new boundaries. When you gerrymander districts, here in Illinois, it's gerrymandered to the benefits of, of Democrats. In Republican areas, it's gerrymandered to the benefits of Republicans. I truly believe we need independent districting because when you have to answer to a constituency that is not uniform, that is diverse, then you have to become, it moderates you. But when you have these districts that are so partisan, then the partisan, you know, the extremes, they're the ones who have the real power and not the, not, not the middle ground. And you're seeing Adam Kinzinger yesterday, I think or maybe this morning, announcing he's not going to run for re-election. Um, so that's, that's who falls by the wayside. So thank you. Um, next question, is there another side, this side? And by the way, don't give speeches. If you give a speech, you have to run for office. <laughs> Ask your question. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Eileen Donovan. I'm a graduate student at the Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, Senator, I'm a fellow military helicopter pilot, and we have, to, uh, we have to depend on our crews and our fellow service members to do the right thing. How do you balance wanting to trust the better angels of your... Uh, your colleagues to do what is right and knowing that the bar of conduct has been lowered, as you said. You know, tr the military, uh, trust but verify. Um, no, I, it, it has been really depressing for me uh, in the Senate. We, we talked about Mitt Romney, but Mitt Romney has voted along party lines all the time. Adam Kinzinger voted 90% with Donald Trump. Uh, I think what you do is you do everything that you can to make things bipartisan, but, but at some point someone has to stand up for what is right and for the truth. And I think um, that's when you appeal to the, to the people, right? And it's on us to, to re, just because the, the, the standards have been lowered doesn't mean that we should not be there to raise the standards back up for how members of Congress should, um, uh, should, should uh, conduct ourselves, don't you think? I mean, I do, I do. Um, it's, it's very difficult though. Yeah. Uh, I, I relate an anecdote in the book about sitting next to Kevin McCarthy on a plane some years ago and having a, idle conversation and we get to Washington and he goes off and does a briefing to the press uh, and completely misrepresents uh, our conversation and I went up to him on the house floor immediately thereafter and I said Kevin um, if we're having a private conversation on the plane I would have thought it was a private conversation but if it wasn't you know I said exact opposite of what you told the press and he looks at me and he says yeah I know Adam but you know how it goes um, and I was like, no, Kevin, I don't know how it goes. You just make shit up, and that's how you operate. I only say that because 
Tammy uses of, uh, profanity in her book, so I figure I can worse. use it in mine. A lot worse. Um, I use a lot of helicopter crew <laughs> language. No, but, but when I read that, I was like, oh, my God, he's putting it out there. But you know what? It, that needs to be said. Well, you know, yeah. that man wants to be Speaker of the House. That can never be allowed to happen, um, both because he has no more commitment to the truth than Donald Trump, but also because if he became Speaker, effectively Donald Trump would be the Speaker. Um, and had he been Speaker in 2020, had we lost a few more seats in the House, he would have overturned the election. Um, so uh, there are some members where, because of my experience with them, there is no trust. There can't mm -hmm. be any trust. Um, there, are, there are others, though, um, that I feel I, I can still rely on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then probably the greater group is the one Tammy describes where you you trust but verify, or you verify and then you trust. Mm -hmm. um, I, before we go to the next question, I, I want you to talk about Donald Trump. You, you touched on this. Donald Trump can happen again. We, we are, you said midnight in Washington. Yeah. We're, we're not, we've not crossed over into safe territory yet. No, we, we haven't it's at all. Dangerous. And uh, one of the things that really nags at me, um, and, and maybe I can speak more freely about Mr. McConnell than you can, um, and you can feel free to jump on uh, oh, Ken can. McCarthy. Um, <laughs> but there was, a, there was a window of opportunity, I think, after, after the bloody insurrection, when the Republican Party leadership saw to what a terrible end Donald Trump and yes. Trumpism had brought the country, where they contemplated whether to throw him aside. And with Ken McCarthy, that, that fit of conscience, if that's what it was, lasted about 30 seconds. But... but from my vantage point in the House, it seemed like Mitch McConnell was really wrestling with this. And he went to the Senate floor and he gave that speech of blaming Donald Trump as being morally and practically responsible for the insurrection and even intimated at some point that, that impeachment was too good for him, that maybe you know, there were other remedies like prosecution that would be more appropriate. But it was only two weeks after that that he was asked, well, if he's the nominee again, will you support him? And his answer was absolutely. And in that two-week period, we lost the chance to move forward as a country. Donald Trump is running for president again. Um, it would be intolerable for him to see anyone else as the Republican nominee. I mean, you can imagine him watching Mike Pence or Nikki Haley or any of these people as the nominee getting all that attention. He would go out of his mind, even more so out of his mind. Um, and we cannot exclude the possibility that he could win. Um, and and I, I'll tell you, this country didn't look much like itself after the first four years of his presidency. It will look nothing like it does if we have to go through this again. Um, so I know people are thinking, well, maybe he'll be prosecuted. And, um, you know, we, we cannot expect uh, anything other than the need to defeat him and what he represents. Uh, I, have, I have absolute confidence that sometime in the future we will look back on this period as a terrible time we had to go through as a country. Mm -hmm. and, and Trump and Trumpism will be repudiated in the harshest terms along with everyone who went along with it. But we're not there yet. We're not out of the woods yet. Um, and we can't all be Marie Ivanovich, but we can all figure out in our own lives, in our own world, in our own community, uh, how to play a role right now in, in protecting our democracy. Uh, thank you, Congressman and Senator, for your public service and taking the time to speak to us today. I'm a second year in the uh, Harris School of Public Policy. My name's Spencer. Um, I, I really appreciated you acknowledging kind of bipartisan examples of, like the Mitt Romney example. He spoke to the IOP last year on uh, online. Um, I guess in that same vein, I was curious to know if um, you had any thoughts on what role the, the Democratic Party has played in, you know, the rise of Trump and Trumpism and everything else, looking back at, say, the last 10 years, if uh, there's things that you would wish the party had done differently or leadership, et cetera. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that uh, there are a lot of things that made Donald Trump possible. Um, the, the, the wave of xenophobic populism that propelled him into office didn't, didn't start here or with him. Uh, indeed, you could see it in Brexit, you could see it in the rise of, of autocracy in Poland and in Hungary, in now Brazil and in the Philippines and elsewhere. It's a global phenomenon. Part of the driver of that is the changing nature of the global economy. 
uh, with globalization and automation in which millions and millions of people here in America, but around the world, have been losing their jobs through no fault of their own uh, and have even less job security, whatever position they may have. Um, and, and, and here at home, um, there have been huge parts of the country where people have been working till they dropped uh, and had nothing set aside for their retirement and the, the, the future for their kids look even more bleak. And the failure of both parties to address that economic challenge um, provided the most fertile soil for demagoguery. Um, that still, I think, remains the most pressing challenge for the country is that the economy is not working for millions and millions of people. Uh, and, and so when Donald Trump uh, ran in 2016 and claimed to have something to offer to what he described as the, the forgotten people, the people in flyover country, he was talking to people that had a real need. Um, people who thought, you know, we've had a Clinton presidency, we've had a Bush presidency, and nothing has changed my life. Uh, and they were willing to, to support somebody who was going to break everything in the hope that something would be different. Now, of course, he did nothing for them at all except strip the country with a $2.2 trillion tax cut of the resources it might have used to help them. Which is why I think that the bills that we are on the verge of passing right now are so important in their own right to help people, but also as democracy legislation, because at the end of the day, a democracy has to show it can deliver. Uh, and and, and I, so I think, you know, in terms of what's the role of the Democratic Party and where, where does our responsibility lie? Our responsibility lies in the fact that we and the Republican Party both failed mm -hmm. to address the needs of millions of people. Uh, and, and, uh, and we are doing that now. Um, and I think these two bills and the rescue plan we passed are going to be the biggest investment in the welfare of the American people since the New Deal. Uh, so I think we get it. Uh, we were too slow to get it and too slow to act on it. Uh, too slow to deal with the, this burgeoning wealth gap, um, but we're focused on it now, and, uh, and we're going to have to get this right, both for our economy's sake and, and for our democracy's sake. We are almost out of time. I think I'm going to end. I think that was a very good prescription for the future, for uh, our party, for the whole country. I think David was going to do uh, final remarks. Is that right? Okay. And then we'll, um, uh, if it's okay, I'd like to give Adam the last word after you've had yes. a chance to. Yeah, I don't want to give the Hi, book. Dave. How are you? Yes. David Good Axelrod. to see you guys. Yes, class of 76. Good to see you all. <laughs> uh, I, all I wanted to say was, you know, you two are, 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 are friends and people I deeply admire. I wanted to thank you for your courageous service in many ways uh, to this country. And, I, and you, you know, uh, Senator, you said earlier, that you hope to see some of these folks in positions of leadership in the future. And I would just say to young people here that you could, you could scarcely find better examples in, in these two uh, who, who are speaking to us today. So uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give you the final minute. <laughs> um, I'm, going to give, I'm going to give Adam the final minute, and don't forget to buy his book. <laughs> well, thank you. Don't forget to buy her book. Um, <laughs> Tammy, thank you so much for your extraordinary service yeah. to the country and the Congress uh, and for your friendship. Um, and, you know, apropos of what David just said, uh, one of the things that has really uplifted my spirits in the last four years is the quality of the people running for Congress has never been higher. The people who were elected in 2018, the class of 2018 in the House, is by far the strongest class of new members we've ever had. The Alyssa Slotkins, the uh, Abigail Spanbergers, Elaine Luria's, the Tom Malinowski's, the Andy Tom Kim's, Aston. Mike Levins, um, the, the, the too numerous to mention, they're phenomenal. They're phenomenal. Uh, and, and it's not a surprise, I think, that many of them, Jason Crow, uh, many of them are veterans uh, of the armed services, of the State Department, of the intelligence community. And I think in the same way that after 9-11, people joined the service to defend our country, after people saw what Donald Trump uh, and his enablers in Congress were doing to tear down the country, they felt that this was another way to serve. Um, and, 
uh, and they're just extraordinary. The class of 2020 got wiped out tragically uh, in the presidential cycle. We lost seats in the House. The class of 2020 was every bit as talented as the class of 2018. They just had lousy timing. But the fact that, that the quality of people running now is better than ever ought to give us confidence in the future. People are not turning away from public service because of the ugliness of the last four years. They are running to the fight. Um, and, and I hope there are people in this room that are thinking about doing the same. Um, it doesn't mean you have to run for Congress. Um, it might be you decide to serve in a different way or a different office or a different position. But, but the country really needs each and every one of us right now. And I would just say, don't try to do everything, because that way paralysis lies. Don't try to worry about everything. Um, just decide, this is the one thing that I'm going to do. Um, and uh, I'm just so grateful um, to be invited to speak with you today and to be uh, in conversation with Tammy Duckworth, who is a, a personal hero of, of mine uh, and, and the finest example of public service. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.